Start with the, the humble number. <laughs> so that's great. I want to welcome our friends to our Tuesday night Bible study here at the Granite Bay Church. I'm one of the pastors here, Doug Batchelor, and uh, we're joining uh, a kaleidoscope of our church family here and continuing a study in the book of Genesis. In just a moment, we're going to get to Genesis chapter 4, starting with a fresh chapter. We've been going very thoroughly word by word and principle by principle through the book. Uh, I'm going to just make a little shameless announcement, if it's okay. Uh, we are going to be uh, going up to Canada this week and doing a 10-part prophecy series called Prophecy Encounter. You're welcome to join us. Now, we did a Prophecy Encounter program in Florida a couple of years ago. This is Prophecy Encounter Canada. So a lot of some of the same evangelistic programs, but there'll be some new illustrations. If you've got some friends, you might want to tune into that. Um, is there a, the website, uh, Santiago? Do they just go to the Doug Batchelor website? Santiago, he's listening to the phone to see if it's working. <laughs> Do they go to the Doug Batchelor website or the Amazing Facts website for the Prophecy Encounter? Uh, Doug Batchelor. Then go to the Doug Batchelor website. Okay, very good. So we, and it starts 7.30 Pacific time, uh, Friday evening, and then goes every night and the uh, last Sabbath morning as well going to be at the uh, Church in the Valley outside of Vancouver. All right, with that, uh, we're going to get into chapter 4 of Genesis, and this is after the entrance of sin. Uh, just a little review. It's amazing how the first three chapters of the Bible, it starts with a paradise, and then it tells how paradise is lost, the tree of life is lost, because of this serpent introducing evil. And then you've got... Uh, problems for 65 books and uh, the plan of redemption. Then you get the last three chapters of the Bible and the serpent is destroyed, uh, the seed of the woman is worshipped, the tree of life is restored, and sin is done away with. And so it's almost like you've got, the, the whole Bible is kind of written in this, uh, this up and down um, uh, sequence and it reaches its ultimate conclusion at the end. And um, sin has now entered the world in chapter 3. Um, a lot of people ask the question. We had the question, I think, last week in our um, Bible questions up front. How long did Adam and Eve enjoy the garden before um, they fell, before the sin entered the world? And conventional wisdom is wasn't very long, maybe a matter of weeks or months. Probably happened pretty quickly. Uh, the best argument being that God's final command to them before sin is go forth, be fruitful, multiply. They were in perfect health, everything was operational, and they still hadn't had any children yet. So we're led to believe that the devil introduced sin. He, he, you know, he catch, catches you by surprise quickly. It was a blitzkrieg, and uh, there was a fall. So now they've been evicted from the garden. Chapter 4 begins, Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now the word Cain, it means acquisition or uh, a purchase. And uh, so she said, this is the man. Some wonder from the name that she gave that if perhaps Adam and Eve thought, would Cain be the Savior? They knew that through their descendants a Savior. God would somehow be incarnate and come into the world as a Redeemer. And uh, the promise of the Savior was given right there to Eve in Genesis chapter 3.15. Adam and Eve received the promise. So she thought, maybe this is him, if they only knew how many generations they were going to have to wait. Um, and then it goes on to say, she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now before I go very far, I've got to just address something. Um, these were not the only children Adam and Eve had. Before this chapter is over, it's going to talk about Cain taking his wife and, and going out from the presence of the Lord and founding another city. And a lot of people, we always get this question during our Bible answer program in, in January. People say, I'm going to read through the Bible. And they get to chapter 4 and they go, you know, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. And then later it says Cain took his wife and they go, what, what, where'd she come from? Was there another race of people out there? And it uh, doesn't say anything about women and very simply Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters you can read that in the next chapter where it says the genealogy of Adam and Eve Adam and Eve had sons and daughters now 
assuming Adam and Eve are healthy and productive, how long did Adam live? 930 years, good. And uh, how long did Eve live? Doesn't say, good, just t testing you. Um, but uh, how old was Sarah when she had a baby? 90, Adam, uh, Abraham was 100, no, I think she was 90. And, um, uh, and think about it, when Sarah was 65, Abraham went to Egypt and he said, she's so beautiful just say you're my sister because they might kill me and take you. So they aged more slowly. The reproductive time was longer. 90 was a stretch even back then. It was a miracle. But uh, the reproductive time was longer. Some of the, you look through the genealogy, sometimes they didn't get married till 105. So and then you live 900 years. And the reason I'm making this point is their reproductive years were about 300 years. Now, if you think that some Latter-day Saints have large families, <laughs> or some Catholics have large families, um, the people back then, I think in modern times, this is one lady in Russia who had like 68 children, a lot of twins and triplets. It was incredible. Uh, but um, you can imagine how many children you could have if you had you know, 500 productive years, or 300 productive years. Uh, so they had a lot of children. They were told to be fruitful and fill the earth. And um, so Cain took one of his sisters as his wife. Now I know when we hear that today we think, wow, that's really strange. Isn't that forbidden? Adam and Eve technically were brother and sister. They had the same parents. Uh, so man, it's even weirder than that. Eve came out of his rib. A and so it wasn't in until you get further away from Adam and Eve, there started becoming genetic problems. By the time of Moses, you're not supposed to marry close to the family tree. You think about it, um, Abraham married his half-sister. Not his stepsister, his half-sister. They shared the same father. Uh, Jacob married his first cousin. So that was not uncommon back then. Uh, anyway, so that's, I'm just talking about Adam and Eve. The only reason it mentions Cain and Abel is because it's establishing the lines for the genealogies you will see later. Typically, the genealogies are all traced through the, the male children and usually the firstborn. It's telling the story about Cain and Abel because the genealogy of Christ doesn't come through Abel or Cain. It ends up coming through Seth, who sort of by default becomes the third firstborn because Cain goes off from the presence of the Lord. So that's why Moses is relating this part of the story. I hope that made sense. Then she bore again his brother Abel. And Abel means a breath or vapor. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So right away we see there's a, a vast difference. Isn't it interesting how the same parents can have vastly different children? And you know the first thing that uh, I do sometimes if I'm traveling, I see children traveling with what I think is their parents. I look at their parents, I look at their children, I kind of wonder who they look like. Because you can often just see the, the resemblances in the family. And um, now is there anything wrong with being a farmer? Cain was a tiller of the soil. Matter of fact, that was sort of the first job God gave Adam and Eve uh, to keep the garden. Um, now if you tell a person that you're a grower and you're from Northern California, it means something completely different. But there was nothing wrong with Cain being a tiller of the soil. Matter of fact, Part of the curse that later comes to Cain is it says, now in the sweat of your face you will fill the ground, which is what we're all dealing with today. It must have been even much more pleasant back then when he was a horticulturist. And uh, what is a little different is Abel now is keeping domestic animals. Why? All of a sudden that's introduced. Um, I think it's connected with the sacrificial system. Last thing you see is Adam and Eve leave the garden. God gives them coats of skin. They try to cover their nakedness with the fig leaves. God says that will not work. He gives them coat of skin. Where do you get skin? Got to get it from there. It has to be a death. Revelation talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So there by the gates of the Garden of Eden, God establishes the sacrificial system. And they realize those lambs that they are to, on a semi-regular basis, offer 
is a reminder of God's son that would die for them someday. The blood that is shed is a reminder of the cost and the penalty of sin. And uh, Abel, he loves animals. Now, can you think of another set of brothers that um, were very different? Yeah, now Cain and Abel, you know, so not twins. It makes it very clear she has one and she has the other. Joseph and his brothers are different, but Jacob and Esau, twins, not identical twins. And one is a hunter, and the other one is a keeper of sheep. And uh, just very different, you know. One is a, says he's smooth skinned, the other one's like a gorilla. I don't know exactly, it's hard to imagine exactly what is meant by it, because he's a hairy man. And um, so, um, very different brothers. And you can see some other examples of that in the Bible. You look at Peter and Andrew. Now they got along, but they're pretty different. You look at their temperaments and how they respond in the Bible. My brother and I, uh, we nearly killed each other too. But that would have been the younger killing the older. Uh, my brother was older than me, but he had flaming red hair, brown eyes, freckles all over. And I looked uh, more like my mother. She was bald. And no, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I look. Uh, I do look like my father, but you know, it's just it's interesting how how different. But we had the same mother and father, but just very, very different looking. So these two boys uh, end up different now. Something you ought to ask at this point, it's also true that you can have the same parents, two different children, and one turns good and one turns bad. Is that always the fault of the parents? Or do children get to make their own choices? Yeah, they do. And, and that was also the same with uh, Jacob and Esau. God gives us freedom. So right away, we begin to see there's a difference between them. It says, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering. Now, this process of time means it wasn't done every day, but the time came for their thank offering, the sin offering. Um, they probably were not following the Mosaic sacrificial calendar. That, of course, hadn't happened yet. But God had prescribed times when they would come and make their offerings. It may have been governed by the moon or the year. We don't know. Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstling of his flock and their fat. Now I picture they're not very far away from each other and they establish altars maybe near the gates of the Garden of Eden. They can still look and see the evidence of a living angel, cherubim, seraphim, guarding the way to the tree of life. I mean, it was still, you know, they were living where they knew they were, they didn't believe in evolution back then. Uh, they all knew they were made by God. They knew what the penalty of sin was. They bring their offerings, they build their altars, and you can read about this in the book uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, now the instruction was, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Cain knew that. The plan of salvation had been very clearly explained to Adam and Eve. They understood the plan of salvation probably better than we do in many ways. Um, but Cain thought, you know, you're a shepherd, you bring a sheep, I'm a farmer, I'm going to bring the fruits to the ground. It's a sacrifice, they're both sacrifices. But he thought, you know, I'm going to try and do something creative. Whatever his reasons were, he was doing it differently from what God had said. And uh, he probably had a lot of arguments he made with himself and rationalizations and this sacrificing is messy and it's bloody and, and um, barbaric or who knows what, what was going through his mind. But he didn't want to do what God said. And it says, the Lord had respect to Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Now how do you think God showed respect? You can read when, uh, in the days of Moses, when they dedicated the sanctuary, fire came down from God out of heaven. When Elijah built an altar and the prophets of Baal built an altar, God showed respect to Elijah's offering. Fire came down from God out of heaven. When Solomon built his temple, according to the plan that David had given, and he consecrated it. Now you don't find this in uh, uh, Second Kings, but you do find it in, or First Kings rather, but you do find it in Chronicles. It says the glory of the Lord came down and consumed the sacrifice. And so, uh, I believe that God brought fire down and consumed the sacrifice. You also see this in the story of 
Samson's parents, remember? They brought an offering and fire went up out of the rock and burnt the offering. And so I believe they're, they were living very close to the time where they talked and walked with God. I think fire came down to show respect to Abel's offering, that it was accepted, but all that Cain got was fruit flies. Uh, when it says he brought the fruit of the ground, we don't know exactly what fruit he brought, but something from his works. One sacrifice is looking for trusting in the blood of a sacrifice of, of this animal. The other is really trusting in his own production, his own works. Uh, one requires the loss of a life, and the other one does not. And so there's some very big differences here. And it says that when God didn't accept his offering, so his countenance fell. He began to murmur and complain and grumble and he was upset. And so the Lord said to Cain, just think about how nice this is that God condescends to talk to Cain. He's pleading, he's appealing to him. Does the Lord want anyone to perish? He's appealing to Cain. He says, don't be stubborn, don't be proud, do what I say. And uh, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Now, is that a promise for us today? Do we know what God wants us to do? What has He required of you, O oh man, but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God? It's not that hard to say, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Matter of fact, the Bible says His commandments are not burdensome. Uh, it's easier to be saved than lost. You really have to rebel against God. So his countenance fell and he was angry. It was his pride. How did the devil fall? Pride. Am I right? And he said, uh, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. Sin is trying to control us. But you should rule over it. We should not have the flesh govern the spirit, or, or, yeah, but the spirit should govern the flesh. And so he was, God was saying, do not let it have the mastery over you. And the Lord appealed to him. So now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And Abel was appealing to his brother, his older brother, and saying, why don't you do what God says? You'll be blessed, you'll be accepted. And as they went back and forth, it became more intense. Cain became so angry. Now no one had ever murdered anyone else before. Um, they knew that death happened. How did they know that death could happen? Lambs were sacrificed. <laughs> they understood death. I mean, what did God say to Adam and Eve would happen if they disobeyed? You will surely die. And so they understood. You keep in mind, God, when He created Adam and Eve, downloaded into their minds a vocabulary. They knew what the meanings of these words were. You would cease, you will perish. And um, he became so angry, we don't know exactly what it does, but it says he rose up against Abel, may have grabbed, you know, painters say it's a rock or a stick, we don't know what he did. Um, strangled him, or who knows, it's, it, but somehow he brutally killed in a fit of anger his brother. I don't think it was premeditated. I think it was in a fit of anger and pride he struck him down. Now, you notice something that you find happening here that happens several times in the Bible is um, you've got family feuds. This is your first family feud. Um, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. Joseph was sold by his brothers. Abimelech, the son of Gideon, killed 70 of his brothers. Absalom murdered Amnon, his brother. The prodigal son older brother was very angry with his younger brother. Jephthah was evicted from the family by his brothers. The Bible says, love your neighbor. You know what neighbor means? Nigh, bro. <laughs> it means your near brother. That's your neighbor. The Bible says, love your neighbor. And um, it also says, love your enemy. Now, I wonder sometimes if God says, love your neighbor and love your enemy, because he knew that often our near, our near brother would be our enemy. But it doesn't stop there. Just look at the history of the Bible. I did a worship today at Amazing Facts where I talked a little bit about some of these things. And during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War that was fought when Kuwait was invaded, 
Uh, it's one of the few wars in history where I think there was about 100 American casualties, which is pretty small for a war. Uh, but what was different was the majority of them were not from the Iraqis, it was from friendly fire that the Americans fired on our own troops or we were fired on by the French or some of the other forces that were all coordinating because they misunderstood who they were. And you know, I think it's still true in the church today that <laughs> more people are taken out by friendly fire. Uh, as a pastor, when you, you visit with people that have become discouraged and they've stopped going to church, sometimes people slowly slide out just through neglect, but a lot of times they stop going because they didn't feel appreciated or someone said something or did something to offend them. And how many of you have known someone like that? And stuff. It's, uh, but people that claim to follow Jesus get in the way and they look at their brother and they're offended. Friendly fire. Um, did Paul and Barnabas have a dispute? Does it even happen among good Christians? Did the apostles argue among themselves about which was the greatest? And what was that? Pride. Same thing to cause the feud in heaven is what still causes feuds on earth. How about uh, Sarah and Hagar? A family feud that turned into divorce where Hagar was put away. You got Jacob and Esau. We talked about Joseph and his brothers. Did Moses have problems with his siblings? Yeah, one of them was struck with leprosy because of a family feud. Miriam, I think, took offense that uh, Moses married a non-Israelite. <clears throat> uh, how about the wives of Elkanah, namely Hannah and Peninnah? That would have been a really tough family to live in. Uh, it says that Hannah, uh, if Hannah's sister wife was called her adversary. I have to live under the roof with an adversary wife. You know what the word de devil means? Adversary. And uh, I already kind of glazed over Jacob and Esau, but what about Jacob's family? You ever listen to Rachel and Leah? How they battled over their husband's affections and they got to where they hated each other and they were sisters. Um, David, did my, oh, Mike popped off for a second. David and uh, his brothers didn't understand him. David was chased by his own king. Later, David's chased by his own son, Absalom. Um, and you know it says in 2 Timothy 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. So it talks about children. I, I, uh, Karen and I got a call this week from Nathan. We, he's in the South Pacific and he was doing some studying. It was Sabbath morning for him. It was Friday night for us. and and. Uh, he had a little trouble. He, he was reading where Jesus said, in the last days a man's foes will be they of his own house. And uh, it's here in Matthew chapter 10. It says, uh, I've come to set uh, a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes will be they of his own household. And Nathan said, are we good? <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't worry, son, you just stick with the Bible, we'll be okay. <laughs> what happened to northern Israel? They rebelled against the southern kingdom and there was a big civil war for the remaining history from the time of Solomon until they were both conquered. They couldn't get along. Now, and so I'm, I'm kind of just bearing this out to say that what you see happening in the very beginning of the Bible is going to repeat itself. Matter of fact, there's a quote from the book um, Acts of the Apostles, page 72. Cain and Abel represent two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. One class avail themselves of the appointed sacrifice for sin. The other venture to, to depend on their own merits. Theirs is a sacrifice without the virtue of a divine mediation and thus it's not able to bring man into favor with God. It is only through the merits of Jesus that our trespasses can be pardoned. Those who feel no need of the blood of Christ who feel that without divine grace they can by their own works secure the approval of God are making the same mistake as did Cain. If they do not accept the cleansing blood they are under condemnation. There is no other provision made whereby they can be released from the thraldom of sin. Notice, I'm still reading from page 73, 72. 
The class of the class of worshipers who follow the example of Cain includes by far the greater portion of the world. For nearly every false religion has been based on the same principle that man can depend on his own efforts or works for salvation. It's claimed by some that the human race is not in need of redemption, but that of development, that it can refine, elevate, regenerate itself. As Cain thought to secure the divine favor by an offering that lacked the blood of a sacrifice, so these expect to exalt humanity to the divine standard independent of the atonement. The history of Cain shows what must be the results. It shows that man will become what man will become apart from Christ. Humanity has no power to regenerate itself. It does not tend upward towards the divine, but downward towards the satanic. Christ is our only hope. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so the whole pr uh, um, principle here is, you know, salvation by works, which is the foundation for the Tower of Babel and for every false religion. Now something else, what's going to happen in the last days? How many classes will there be? Two. Will they both claim to worship the same God? Both claim to offer to the same God? But one's going to do it their own way. They're going to alter the commands of God. The other's going to do it the way God specifies in His Word. And the one who does it wrong will persecute the one who does it right. Cain was not angry at Abel because of Abel's badness. He was angry at Abel because of Abel's goodness. Now Abel's a type of Christ. He was, Abel was a good shepherd. He makes a sacrifice and then he dies. And Jesus is our good shepherd. And it says that in Hebrews, the blood of Christ, let me read this to you here. Um, Hebrews 11, 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Cain, uh, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts and through it, he being dead, still speaks. You know, when Jesus pronounced a curse on Jerusalem, He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen does her chicks under her wings, but you would not. And He concludes His remarks by saying that upon you is going to come all of the blood, all the righteous blood, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of, He says, the son of Berechiah. It's probably Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada who is slain between the porch and the altar. He is a martyr, one of the priests that was slain by King Josiah. So Jesus covers the span of history from the blood of righteous Abel all the way to the blood of this righteous priest who dies shortly before you know, the books of uh, Malachi were completed. And um, he says all that guilt and blood is going to come on this generation. If you ever read the book The Great Controversy, it begins with a very troubling chapter about the fall of Jerusalem and all the judgment that came on the people and that was like pent up judgment. So the reason I say that is because we're going to talk about the blood of Abel here in just a moment. Alright, carrying on. So he kills his brother and the Lord says, verse 9, he's still talking to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Now did God misplace Abel? Why does God ask questions? When God says to Adam, where are you? Had God misplaced Adam? <laughs> or did God already know? When Jesus said to the disciples, um, what were you talking about on the road? Did He know what they were talking about? Uh, as a matter of fact, there's two or three questions that Jesus asks and it's very clear. He's just like when they ran out of bread, He says, you know, what do you suggest we do? Well, He knew what He was going to do. Um, so sometimes the Lord asks rhetorical questions. He's trying to get us to think. So when He says, where is your brother? The Lord is really asking a question that's very penetrating. Um, you're the older brother. You should have been thinking about protecting, watching over, guiding, teaching. And instead you murdered. Where is your brother? Now, you got the older murdering the younger. Oh, there's so much here. I, I, I don't know uh, how far, far we'll get. I'm going to see if I can get through chapter 4. But um, quiz. Who was older? Moses, Aaron, Miriam. Miriam's the oldest, then Aaron, 
Moses is the baby. He's the youngest. Of Jesse's seven sons. Now, you know, there's a little conundrum in the Bible. One time it says Jesse's seven sons. The other time it talks about David's seven brothers. That would be eight, including David. But anyway, who was the youngest? David. Among the sons of Jacob, who's the youngest? Benjamin. But then Joseph is the youngest of the 11 that went off to take care of the sheep. And he's the one that gets persecuted. Um, Jephthah, youngest. You, you'll notice that it's often, who's the prodigal that goes away, comes back, and makes it to the father's house? It's the younger one. And, and so you often find that, um, I, I want you to know I was the youngest. I think I mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, you know, these are all types of Christ is the reason I'm, I'm uh, bearing that out. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Who's the youngest? Jacob. Who gets the blessing? Jacob does. So it's, a, some, it's like a precedent to set here. He says, where is your brother? And he says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Wow. You know, if you, if you talk back when I was a kid, if you talk sarcastically to your mother, you might get it. Um, talking sarcastically to God. Am I my brother's keeper? I mean... Did he really think that God didn't know where Abel was or what had happened? That God somehow didn't know all things? But you know what that tells us about Cain? Cain somehow did not believe in the omniscience or the omnipresence of God, which is like a generation near the end. Do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? And you know what? There's, there's a jab in here. What was, what was Abel's job? Keeper of sheep. And he's speaking scornfully of his brother's occupation. I'm not my brother's shepherd. What was the occupation of um, the children of Israel? They're shepherds. You remember, how did the Egyptians view shepherds? It's an abominable work. It's a dirty work. You know, you spend your whole day following the south end of a northbound sheep, <laughs> and they're, they, they were considered the very least. But who does Jesus reveal himself to when he comes the first time? Shepherds. What was Joseph's occupation? No, Joseph, the brother, son of Jacob, sorry. No, you're right about that one. <laughs> I'm thinking about, he's a shepherd. David? Shepherd. How did Moses get ready? He's a shepherd. And um, you got a number of the uh, characters in the Bible that they're shepherds like that. All right, back to our story here. He says, am I my brother's keeper? God, he just gets right to the point. He says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, does the blood really cry? No. Or is it, talking about, is it talking about justice speaking up? And so, can you find a place in Revelation? Do you remember where it says, and the souls that were under the altar cried out, saying, how long, O Lord? Do the souls really cry out, saying, you know, when are you going to avenge our blood? Or is it speaking in poetry? saying that they're waiting for justice. And God is saying, look, the innocent blood of your brother is crying out for justice because of what you've done. So now, that because your brother's blood is crying out, you are cursed from the earth that has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. That means you'll, you'll never have peace. You're always going to feel like you're wandering, that you're always rejected. Um, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I could bear. Now he's showing some repentance. But is he repenting because of sorrow over what he's done? Or is he repenting like Judas because he's afraid of the consequences on him? He's still entirely sorrowful. He is more sorry about the, you know, it's like Jonah was upset when the gourd died. He was, Jonah was more upset about the plant that died than 120,000 children that lived in Nineveh. And Cain is more upset now than what's going to happen to his vegetable garden than his brother's dead. And it's always amazing to me that the people who crucified Jesus, they went home so they, hurry, they could hurry home keep the Sabbath. <laughs> you, you know, you just killed the Lord of the Sabbath. And, and uh, it's amazing how people can... Uh, cover their conscience like that. Cain said, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you've driven me out this day from the face of the ground. 
I shall be hidden from your face, and I'll be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it, what, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Now, people have often asked those questions and they say, there must have been another civilization in the world back then because Cain takes his wife and he's worried about other people killing him. I thought it was just Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve. Who's going to kill him? Cain knew that Adam and Eve had been told to be fruitful and fill the earth. Who knows how many other brothers and sisters he had. A hundred years may have gone by, we don't know, before Abel is killed. And there could have been a lot of other people and he knew they'd spread over the earth. You don't have to be a genius to do the math. And uh, he thought, among the civilizations, when people see me, I will be the, a marked man, <laughs> which ends up becoming true. He says, whoever sees me will kill me. And um, the Lord said, verse 15, I'm in chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 15. The Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. Now, what does that tell us about who has the right for vengeance? Doesn't the Lord say, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And we are not to set ourselves up as judges. Um, now, there's, I mean, if you had a, a government, it doesn't mean you're never supposed to have a judge in a government. Of course you are, and you're supposed to have sentences. But uh, when it comes to a personal offense, when we start to get even, God says, look, I'll take care of these things. Don't you do it. Um, and he says, um, sevenfold vengeance will be taken on him. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Now, do we go to Revelation and you see also there's another cursed group that's got a mark? You know, you got the seal of God, then you got, and that's in the forehead, and then you got the mark of the beast. It's very interesting that Revelation is sort of echoes of what you're finding in uh, Genesis, or, yeah, that's what I meant to say. What was that mark that Cain got? The Bible says no more about it. Uh, all we can do is speculate. Some wondered, you know, if there were some physical mark. Um, others have argued that that word can also be used to mean I will place some form of a distinguishing difference. You've probably heard in English we have an expression, see that man, he's a marked man. It doesn't mean someone ran over and put a big check on his forehead. Who was it? Uh, Charles Manson died a little while ago. He's that infamous um, murderer, yeah, he had a swastika in the middle of his forehead and uh, people picture when he marked Cain that God did something, put 666 in his forehead or, or something like that. It doesn't say, but you know, there, there's all kinds of theories. We really don't know, so we've got to be careful. I don't know if any of you got any theories you, you, you want to share, but uh, I've not found anything definitive in the Bible about exactly what that mark was or even in the spirit of prophecy. So the Lord did something to set him apart. Um, and he says, the Lord put him, excuse me? He gave him an attitude. I don't know, he did, I think the Lord, you, you know what he did is, for one thing, the very statement of God, if anyone harms Cain because of what he's done, I will get vengeance on him sevenfold. That word spread and everybody thought there'll be a whammy on you if you do anything to Cain. And so that was sort of the word of the Lord was a protection for him. And that way he was marked, you might say. Um, and then if you go to verse 16, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, in the Bible, did God run from man or did man run from God? You notice Adam and Eve, the Lord came looking for Adam and he says, Where are you? And Adam and Eve ran from God. Someone said the first question in the Bible is God saying, where are you? Uh, technically, the first question is the devil saying, hath God said? The first question God asks in the Bible is, where are you? And then the first question you find in the New Testament is, where is he? The wise men looking for Jesus. And so you've got God looking for man, and then you've got man looking for God. We've been separated from the presence of God. The plan of salvation is designed to restore us to God's presence through Jesus. Jesus' cross is a ladder that links us back with heaven, right? So um, you see this taking place here in the Bible, and um, finally you get to Revelation, and it says ultimately we will see God face to face. So reading on here, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and he dwelt in the land of Nod, 
And I know every Sabbath when I preach, I see people taking journeys to the land of Nod. <laughs> that was cheap, huh? <laughs> it's one of those preacher Bible jokes. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, and Cain knew his wife. And that's where everyone goes, wait, what? Where'd she come from? He knew his wife. He took one of his sisters. Hopefully it was consensual. He took one of his sisters, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And this is not the later Enoch. The, a lot of the names you'll find are repeated from the line of Cain. It's almost like they're parallels in the line of, of Aseth. And he built a city. And he called the city after the name of his son Enoch. And to Enoch was born Erod. And Erod begot Mahuliel. And Mahuliel begat Methusiel. And Methusiel begat Lamech. And then Lamech took for himself two wives. And that's the first example of polygamy in the Bible. The name of one was Ada. And the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents. He must have been the first that said, hey, I think I'm going to make a tent to protect me from the environments and to have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. And he was the father of all those who play the harp and the flute. Have you ever used the word jubilation or jubilee? It all traces back to Jubal, who is the father of these musical instruments. And do you know what the word harp is? Harp is a stringed instrument that uses a wooden sounding board to resonate the sound. The way you say harp in Greek is kitara. And you know how you say guitar in Spanish? Guitara. And it's really, it's, it's, it's a very similar word because it's a very similar instrument. So I, I got that whole study together because the first time I played guitar in church, some of the saints thought that it was like rock music coming into the church. And I had to convince them that it, there's nothing wrong with a guitar per se because we're going to play guitars in heaven. <laughs> the guitarists. <laughs> it's just a little different shape. Anyway, the, you know, the, the uh, harp that David played is called a lyre. What's better, a guitar or a lyre in church? <laughs> so that's what they're called. And so here you've got uh, Jabel and you've got Jubal. And uh, boy, you know when parents get upset and they start calling their kids and they go through all the names? Yeah. Can you just picture that? Jubal, 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 come here. And you can't, can't figure out which one. He was a father of those who play the harp and the flute. And as for Zilla, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor in every craftsman in bronze and iron. But you want to know where the Iron Age is? It's right here in Genesis chapter 4. And the sister of Tubal Cain is Naamah. Now this is interesting that it mentions the wives' names. It doesn't often do this. Then Lamech makes this statement. And Lamech says to his wives, Adel and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to me. Listen to my speech. He's speaking in sort of a rhyme here. For I have killed a man for wounding me. There must have been some disagreement or fight. Even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy times sevenfold. Now it's interesting here you've got, he, he kills a young man and he talks about seventy times seven. And you go to the New Testament and Jesus is talking about forgiveness and he says it should be seventy times seven. And it's like these are opposites. One is from the line of Cain and he's worried about protecting himself and he takes vengeance, and the other is Jesus saying, forgive your brother, in the parable in um, Matthew 18. So it's just very interesting. And then Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and named him Seth. For God has appointed, the word Seth means appointed, God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So this is a bright spot for Adam and Eve after a very dark experience. Can you imagine uh, two parent, uh, parents, they've got uh, two principal sons, one kills the other, and the one who kills his brother needs to run, and they're sort of deprived of both? Can you think of a similar story in the Bible? I see Pastor Ross, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, Joab, the general of King David, was trying to get David to reconcile with his son Absalom. And um, Joab talked to this wise woman of Tekoa to go in and she concocted this whole story. 
to try to get David to forgive Absalom for killing his brother and bring him back to the kingdom. Absalom was very beautiful and talented and Joab thought he should really be the next king as opposed to Solomon. So the woman of Tekoa at the coaxing of Joab comes in before the king to try to get justice and she says, my lord king please help. She says, my two sons, I'm a widow and I've only got two boys. And the boys were fighting together, these brothers. And one rose up and killed his sibling. And now the rest of the family has grabbed my other son and they want to execute him and it'll put out my light. I'll have no inheritance. I'll lose both sons. And she's crying before the king. And um, the king says, well, hey, look, hey, I'll, I'll work something out. And she keeps begging. Finally, you know, she div divulges that she's really there uh, at the request of Joab to try to get David to forgive Absalom for killing um, Amnon. And uh, so this is similar though, here you've got uh, you know, Adam and Eve are grieving the loss of, of Cain and Abel in a sense. So to comfort them they get Seth. Seth is more like his father. Ellen White says he resembled him more. His attitude was more of one of worship and dignity. And then the descendants through the instruction of Adam and Eve and Seth you had a whole generation of people that began to call on the Lord. Now I'm going to jump ahead and tell you real quick, I'm jumping up to Genesis 6, but there's a reason they're connected. <clears throat> you read later in Genesis 6, it tells us that when the sons of God, you can turn there if you've got your Bible. <clears throat> came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now what does that mean? People read that, I'll tell you, you'll even find some Bible translations that say, who are these sons of God? Well they must be angels, but they're marrying people. They're not supposed to do that. They must be fallen angels. And I've heard some pastors say, these fallen angels, these demons, married humans and had babies with them that became giants. And that's why God had to wipe everyone else during the flood because people were sort of amalgamated, half demon, half human. And uh, there's a few crazy theories that have come out of that. Others say these are aliens that came down from the heavens. Because you know, God clearly says angels don't marry or give in marriage. Angels don't reproduce. Angels are never born. It says they're created. And so um, all kinds of crazy theories. Have you heard any of these? Even some Bible translations. Oh yeah. Who are the sons of God? They're not angels. Now there is a place where angels are called sons of God in the Bible. It's a general term. The sons of God, look at um, 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. And Isaiah says that we will be sons and daughters of God. And um, whoever accepts Christ, he says, you become a son of God. You're adopted into the family. Jesus says to you what he said to Jesus. Or God says to you when you're baptized, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased. The children of Seth were calling on the name of the Lord. They stayed separate from the children of Cain and as long as they maintained that separation from the wickedness of Cain and his posterity, they were holy. Well, when you get to chapter 6, that separation is lost. And it's lost because they began to intermarry with the wives of the daughters of Cain which did not worship the Lord. So you got two distinct groups. You got the sons of God and the daughters of men. You got the children of Cain and the children of Seth. And you know you can even read this if you ever read any commentaries. Matthew Henry's commentary is pretty clear. He makes some good arguments for this. But that's why it's saying that the descendants of Seth, they were calling on the name of the Lord. There, there was a holy seed that happened then. But when the sons saw the forbidden daughters, do you find that story, <laughs> people are going to think this, misunderstand me, it's biblical. Do you find that repeating itself? What got Solomon in trouble? His wives, he began to marry pagan wives, they drew away his heart. What got um, David in trouble? Bathsheba, she, she was maybe not a foreigner, we don't know that. What got um, Samson in trouble? He's dating the Philistines. And do we still have problems with people in the church not believing? the part that says you shouldn't be unequally yoked yep. together. It, it doesn't ever work very well biblically. All right, well, I, let me see if I got anything in, interesting that I left out here. Um, and you can read that chapter that I mentioned there. There's a great chapter on this in Acts of the Apostles. It talks about Cain and Abel. 
talks about the distinction of worship. We're facing some of these stra- same things. So we want to avoid the uh, friendly fire. I'll close with a story. When Karen and I were in uh, Spain a couple of weeks ago, they took us to show us the largest tree in Spain. You know what it is? The redwood. It's a redwood that was donated to Queen Isabella. <laughs> Not Isabella that sent off Columbus, one of the other Isabellas. And they planted it outside the palace. It came from California, like right out 1850, right after the gold rush. They saw these big trees, and it was, it's the sequoias, not the ones on the coast. And we were surprised. They had two, they brought several of them. They had the two very large redwoods. They're hundreds of years old. And, um, but you know, the coastal redwoods are different from the inland redwoods. I think most of you know that if you're good Californians. The inland redwoods, they'll put down a big taproot. And they'll grow on the mountainside, and they grow in a drier region. The coastal redwoods are very shallow roots. The roots may not go down six feet. And you wonder, how in the world can a tree stand that tall with such a shallow root base? And the key is, they go out, and they tie themselves together with the roots of the others around them, and they gather stability and strength that way. I used to go rapid riding with some friends. We used to kayak. And sometimes if you're go- going through some rough rapids, one of the little tricks you could do, if the river's ro- wide enough, you go alongside someone else in the kayak, you grab their boat, they grab your boat, you go through together, you become a pontoon, and there's a lot less chance of your being thrown over. It really works. And if three of you went through and you're all hanging on to each other's boats, very unlikely you're going to capsize. Well, you know, it's like that with people. If, if we want to be stable, we've got to link together. People need each other. We find strength and unity. That's why church is important. You come together, and through our relationships and our networking, we, we gather strength, we gather support, and it helps us stand. We have accountability that helps us be true to God. So let's see if we can avoid the friendly fire. And uh, I want to thank our friends for joining us. You've been watching online. We're going to go do our local prayer requests here. God bless you. Invite you to tune in once again to our programs up in Canada that begin Friday night, 7.30. God bless.